Um, well, this is Jessica Taylor. It's April 22nd, 2023, and we are here at St. Peter the Apostle Catholic Church. And um, this is for the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program, and the project is the Tidewater Main Street Project. And uh, who do I have the pleasure of speaking with today? I am Father Michael McAndrew, a Redemptorist missionary, and I am a, uh, Associate Director of the Catholic Migrant Farm Worker Network. Great. And uh, when and where were you born? I was born in Omaha, Nebraska, 1947. Mm -hmm. And um, what, was, uh, what was your family life like at home? I was from a very Catholic neighborhood and family. Uh, my, my mother and father are both from families of 10. I'm the oldest of seven. I grew up in a neighborhood that was all Catholic. We had a parish grade school and high school, and we had uh, 2,000 kids in that school. The only public school in our neighborhood had about 150, and half of them were Catholic. So I was in a Catholic neighborhood. <laughs> Grew up, all, and the parish I was from had 40 men who had become priests, and many of them were missionaries. And I, I was impressed by them, and I always wanted to be a missionary in Brazil, but never got there. But I ended up in Hispanic ministry here. Why Brazil? Well, that's where our neighbors, uh, my next door neighbor, his his parents were there, and. Um, he would come home and show us pictures of the life in the jungle, and I thought that was an adventure. Uh, what was your relationship like with your faith uh, as a child? I grew up right across the street from the rectory and played on the school playground all the time. And when we would walk to go to, I'd walk over to my best friend's house. I'd always pass by the church, and we had the custom of when we'd go to each other's house, we'd we'd walk through the church as. Sort of like, I mean, that was our visit, with, but it was usually sort of a quick run through the church. But that was, the church was part of our life uh, and but part of it. Uh, beyond actually attending church on Sundays, um, were you involved in other aspects? Oh, yeah. I mean, I was in Catholic grade school uh, there and altar server when I was fifth grade and fifth to eighth grade. And I entered a high school seminary uh, right out of grade school. It was, uh, that was the way it was in those days. You entered in 1961. I entered a seminary in Wisconsin, um, and I was so I was gone nine months of the year uh, from my family. But uh, lived uh, I took twelve years of study in the seminary in Wisconsin and New York, where I studied. But that was over that twelve-year period. Mm -hmm. um, and you grew up during um, a moment of a lot of national change. I grew up in, in national and, and church change. I, w I went to the seminary one year before the Vatican Council began, uh, as he began, and um, I was ordained uh, um, in 1973. So I went through that ch transition of th that with that. There was also uh, grow growing up, and I believe in the best time of the, uh, I mean, people look at the 60s and 70s, and some people think of the introduction of drugs and all that stuff. I thought it was a great time to grow up. And we had uh, um, uh, also grew up with the Vietnam War and the struggles of deciding where you were at and supporting it and opposed to it, however you were. And I was, my dad was a veteran of World War II, but he was very much opposed to any war. He hated war. He thought war was, he always said war is when the politicians don't do their job. Um, but he was, uh, um, but he always supported the soldier, no matter what. And it was always, I grew up knowing, make a difference between the soldier and the policy. The policies you can disagree with, the soldiers are, are our brothers and sisters. And you were also um, still in school in moments of the farm workers' movements and the civil rights yes. movements. In fact, when I was in the seminary, the boycott of grapes was going on. And one of the things that happened was we, we would not have grapes at the seminary. And one day we come down to the kitchen, down to the din to dinner, and there's grapes, there's 40 pound box of grapes on the table. We went into the kitchen and told Brother Florian, I said, Brother Florian, don't you know we're supposed to, not supposed to have grapes? And uh, he says, no, no, these are union grapes. We were just told to buy grapes to prove to the work, to the growers that the church would support the, the growers when, when, the grape, when, the, when the union was, was signed. And so we're all at the table going, si se puede as we're eating the grapes. <laughs> that was my experience with them. Uh, and where was the seminary? In New York. Okay, okay. Um, what, what were the, the politics like? How are they different for you in New York, like in terms of the church, but also in terms of 
other social cultural things that are going on in you got to realize when I was in the seminary it was the time when Roe versus Wade came was was made and all that um, we were we were activists with marches with uh, civil rights with the uh, um, we were activists with marches uh, uh, with the uh, UFW and that type of thing so we we were informed of that um, how much I knew about it I can't in those days, I didn't know much about it, except that I did in the seminary. Uh, two summers I spent uh, helping with a migrant camp uh, mission where we would offer children a children's program, uh, education program in the camps. So I did that 1967 and 1972. Mm -hmm. Spent a summer, two summers doing camp, uh, camp work, once in Idaho and once in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you remember particular marches that you or movements that you took part in while you were in New York or that your seminary well, took part in? Well, we marched. We had marches for pro-life. We had marches against uh, um, the nuclear arms. We were we were an active. We had an activist an activist group of students. Not everybody was in it, but some of the students were active in marches for, with. Uh, uh, for the NC, 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 um, uh, for the African American issues, for Hispanic issues, but uh, pro life issues, and uh, in those days, that's what we did. Um, we were out. Uh, I I remember those days in the seminary being being engaged in that. Also, did a little prison uh, visiting and prison ministry uh, as part of my seminary studies with the uh, county jails at that time. Mm -hmm. And it, was it a formal student organization that you were um... No, we our seminary was a small seminary. We had a night we had about 100 students and uh we it, it wasn't like you, well you had you had groups of guys that got engaged with different activities. Okay. I was more with the athletic crowd. I was more with the the uh soccer team. Okay. That was my that was I was more involved with sports <laughs> too much. <laughs> Well, you mentioned the the prison work. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I've 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 been in in every in various places where I've lived. I have never been a a, a prison chaplain as such, but I've been a, a person going to say mass in prisons. I did it in Colorado. I did it in uh, um, in uh, Mississippi a lot, and in California. California, I mostly went to women's prisons, um, but I've done prison um, masses. To get to know what that world is like, but um, and in Colorado we ran a program at the national at the Federal Correction Institute. It's where some of the guys like Timothy McVeigh and Oklahoma bombers were they they were held there and but I ran there. I always said the Spanish masses and got to know the. Um, I was you know I was a super max, so it was quite a interesting experience. Um, what what was that world like? Um, you mentioned you were trying to get to know that world. What was your, what well, were your impressions? I'll say this: that a lot of prisoners that would the prisoners that would come to a mass were oftentimes ones who were looking for at least some meaning in their life, and it, not so necessarily were they all Catholic. I mean, I remember in Mississippi, one man came to our group, and he was uh, uh, it was when Pope Francis came to the United States, and when he was there. We used to have small group to come to the mass, 12, 14 guys, and after the pope came, we'd had we'd had the room packed, uh, 48, 50 people. And this one fellow came in and he said, "I said, are well, you new here?" And he said, "Well, I wanted to find out about the religion of that man that hugged prisoners in Philadelphia when he was in. I think it was in Philadelphia when Pope visited a prison and CNN covered him in the prison and he hugged the prisoners, each one of them, and uh, he he said." I wanted to know the religion of a man who would hug us as prisoners. I thought that was quite an impressive moment. Absolutely. And the Catholic Church during this time period, you said, is going through a lot of changes. How is that influencing your relationship with the work in your faith? Well, I think that we've—I uh, say it's—we've it, we've seen um, uh, movements towards uh, social justice and issues with the uh, people. And I think we had a time when. Uh, the church moved to sort of uh, not pay as much attention to that. I think we it's sort of like we took care of that. We we, we worked with those folks, and I think that um, Hispanic ministry, particularly, uh, has been really evolving in in this country. And 
a lot of the pressures around it have to do with changes in, in the culture, changes in our American reception of our Hispanic immigrant. Uh, I think that we've had some tense times that have hard, caused us a lot, of, a lot of grief. But I also know that uh, uh, I, th I felt we had a good opportunity. We have an opportunity now that I think we can make things better. Uh, primarily, when when the COVID hit, one of the things that you started hearing people talk about was who are the uh, the people who are the essential workers in our country, and one of them they included was farm workers. And I don't think we've we've made enough of that, but I think that at least calling attention. Um, now we have a I think we have a responsibility to do a better job of responding to their their needs. My hope is that we can get some form of a better understanding of immigration in terms of uh, um, a legalization process for people who've been engaged here in our, ministry, our work for a long time. But the other thing is that uh, uh, we also um, recognize that uh, there, it's, a, it's a complex mission. It's not, it's not, it's not just the political answers are not my issue. Uh, I'm looking for how the church can better serve these folks. But I, I wish that our some of our political and border issues we could change our attitudes on. Um, what drew you to your original summer in 1967? That was just one week summer camp preparing a group of children for First Communion. And I was with uh, three seminarians from the Diocese of Boise. And I ended up, uh, my cousin was one of them. And so I visited them and it was, uh, uh, it was just a delight to, for me to, a priest who was very, very engaged with his um, workers in the fields there. They did sugar beets and potatoes and that type of thing. And I got to see a, a diocesan priest and his, his work with the people in a very, uh, a community very dominated by the, the use of migrant farm workers. And then Wisconsin, it was also a First Communion program there. It was, again, one-week programs. And I look back at that, and that helped me when I think we've had a lot of church programs that has gone too far into um, technical education about the sacrament and not about faith. Um, uh, Pope, John, Pope Paul VI said that no one is converted by doctrine or theology. They're converted by the witness and the action of people of faith. And John Paul repeated that. Francis has repeated it a lot. And it, it's... Uh, I, I realized that I'm trying to help people understand that um, the, the doctrine and education in catechesis is important, but it explains the faith, but faith comes from people wanting to, to be loving like they're, the people have they've experienced love from the people. So our job is really, evangelization is, is more about relationship than it is about doctrine. So that's, that's how I hope we can work better with other, other religious groups too. Were there moments um, during those First Communion programs where you experienced that firsthand? Experienced what, what, uh, uh, the 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 fact that you are and other people are living out faith, and and that becomes an oh, example. Oh, absolutely! I think one of the things that I've I've enjoyed most about my migrant work is that uh, um, when you experience people getting to to know their history and their faith or their journey. Um, then comes the question why and the we've seen a lot of young people that have uh, become more active after they they felt loved and cared for my entry to hispanic ministry started in a youth house in inner city streets of denver we worked with street kids who were vulnerable to the drugs and the uh, gang areas around us but as vulnerable youth we simply told them we said there's beans on the stove tortillas in the refrigerator our house is your house and we made a specific intention not to so much preach to them or teach, but to simply welcome them. And 30 years later, we had, we had about 80 real regulars. We had several hundred we touched their lives, but, but in that five-year period, we had about 80 that were just consistent. I mean, I remember talking to one of the girls. I said, why do you come here? And he says, she said uh, that uh, she says, I used to go to the bars after work. And she says, I come here and these guys treat me with dignity and respect. And I know that they don't ask me to do something I don't want to do. And I said, that was pretty neat. 30 years later, we did a, 
every anniversary. And these folks that I had known back in the early 90s came to a meeting, came to a, a, day, of, a day of celebration. And uh, I asked them, what did, what did you get out of Castano Alfonso? They said, first, respect for ourselves, our own sense of dignity, respect for others, and the faith that justifies how our moral life treats us and how we treat one another. And they said, but it started with, you. we, we felt welcomed and loved. And then we had, to, we got to turn around, well, the other person's welcomed and loved too. And then the, the foundation of that was in our faith. It was a neat experience. Yeah. What year was this? 91 to 96, okay. we had that house. And the neat thing is we had an interesting experience at that celebration. We had a mass at a church where an auxiliary bishop was the, the pastor there. And he's, he was brand new to that parish. And he said, well, I'm not going to know who you're, these folks you're, you're inviting here. Well, the church was packed. And with the kids and grandkids and of these, these the, the, the most active members. And in walks a couple first. And he said, well, I know them. Fernando, what are you doing here? And he said, well, um, Teresa and I met at Casa San Alfonso. And Fernando was the, the, one of the more better known choir directors in the Spanish choirs in Denver. And then in, he said, they, they said, well, you know, the other, another person in our group, Ana, she works at the Diocesan Hispanic Ministry Office. So she knows her. And in comes two couples. And the two couples, he said, you guys are also Castan Alfonso? I said, yeah, we met at Castan Alfonso. And they said, he said, Father, these folks direct our, our preparation for marriage program in Spanish. And then he said, he says, you know, these are the most active leaders in our church here in the Diocese of Denver. And I said, yeah, 30 years ago, they were street kids. It was fun. <laughs> I'm struck that there are a lot of different things that you could have spent your life doing. And I'm wondering why um, migrants first and, and also uh, Spanish-speaking communities second. Um, why well, those two? It's, what was easier, your... it's easier to say what I came, why I came into the Redemptorist first was what we say of ourselves we're called to work with the poor and the most abandoned. Uh, we have a, a line from our founder that says we are called to evangelize and be evangelized by the poor. So walking with the poor was my desire. I wanted to help the poor. And um, my dream was to go on a foreign mission. And I've spent 10 years in parishes and more middle class parishes and in the, in the, and then I spent seven years with, as vocation director. And then after those, that 17 years, I went to Denver, and I call it Denver, Mexico, because our parish was the inner city. We, had the, we started a, this youth house so the kids could come and see the priests, not having to go past the secretary and lock doors. The doors were always open. And that was uh, my way into really becoming an Hispanic work. So I've but it was to, to open myself up to learn the life of the people. And like I told you, when I, when I first came, a priest said to me, I hope you walk with my people. We, myself and the other priests and brother who were with me, we said, if we're gonna, we can walk with the people, they're gonna have to let us in to their lives. We have to let them into ours. And, and they came. Um, what surprised you about the work when you first started in Denver? Uh, what's what has really surprised me is um, faith is not based on ideas. Faith is based on on a, uh, a, a respect and a relationship. How a person feels a relationship with the divine in their lives, um, the history of the Latino faith, especially around Juan Diego and the story of Our Lady Guadalupe, is a story not of he was not converted by doctrine. He was converted by um, a feeling of being loved by God and a search for his search for the divine. And then you study the, the theology. I always believe that um, it's, not the, it's not the doctrine that leads us to Christ. It's the, um, the, the belief of others who have witnessed the faith, and we come to them that way. There's also a lot of organizing that has to happen. Yeah. Um, how did you go about learning the skills for that? Um, I'm going to say one of the most important things in, in my personal feeling in my life was athletics, sports, teamwork, uh, playing on a soccer team where you know, n no one person dominates the game. If you have a dominant person in the game, you're probably going to lose because it doesn't work. You have to have teamwork. And I think that uh, 
I mean, and in the seminary, we had a lot of things we did together. And, and I was in a, as a religious order priest in a seminary, we had, uh, uh, we had athletic teams, we, had, we did musicals and plays. And you had to work with, you know, you were on, if you were on stage in a musical, you were singing with an, a group of other people. And it was, for me, the, uh, the community building that I learned through seminary that taught me how to uh, say, okay, now how do I gather other people and work with other leaders? Um, to me, that, that was my, I, one of my greatest lessons. I, I often wonder about our seminaries today because we have seminaries that are smaller, they, they're not independent. They they aren't all seminary, and so many of our seminarians they don't they don't participate in that type of activity. I mean, I mean we had the strongest soccer team in all of Wisconsin when when I was in college. I mean we we went over and, at that time it was they don't they didn't really have much NCAA soccer. It was club teams, and we beat all the other other college clubs because we had guys from Paraguay and Brazil and Thailand and a few of us Americans. How did you adapt what you learned there to Denver, especially considering language skills, um, cultural fluency, things like that? Well, I found that uh, the cultural skills came with, I had good mentors of other priests who worked in the Hispanic ministry. When I look at Enrique Lopez, and he, he's the one that was hard on me to say, you gotta walk with my people, but yet uh, um, those folks, the mentors were there, and and I had a, a a good friend. He and I were the two that had the inspiration to start that youth house. And Patrick and I, we were we both were convinced that we needed to to know the culture and celebrate the culture. One of the things that we decided to do that was I think helpful to both of us was we said we we're going to spend at least two weeks in Mexico every year, visiting families of people we knew in the United States, and we'd visit. So we'd visit various states of Mexico. We would take pictures of the people we knew from Denver down there and take pictures of them coming home for their families, from their families. We, uh, it helped us both better speak Spanish, but also to know the culture and visit the shrines and, and that type of thing. But Patrick and I were very committed to um, learning the culture. It wasn't Language was just part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, so after Denver, what happens next? We had the house in Denver for five years, and then we started a, a mission project, which in the Catholic Church, a mission is, uh, Protestant Church would call them revivals. And we'd have a week-long program, um, spiritual program for parishes, but we did them in English and Spanish, and we concentrated on rural parishes that were getting new influxes of, of migrants coming in. P places that just had new meatpacking plants and poultry plants and, uh, so we we did the missions in Colorado and Oregon and uh, Nebraska, Kansas, Missouri, um, uh, Arkansas, and visiting those places, I got to see uh, the rural communities all. And so I did that for six years. We did 140 missions, and each mission was two weeks long. So you can figure figure in a period of six years, um, 200. Well, not all of them were, were two-week missions. Some of them were one week. We probably had about 240 weeks of uh, mission, um, which is pretty, pretty solid cr time. And we also took lay people with us. So we had a, I, I would travel with uh, another priest and two to four lay people who would, um, they spent, they, they would commit to a nine month period working with us. And that we traveled all over. And how are you seeing people, um how are you seeing people, people's challenges regionally change over that time period? I'll tell you one Catholic change that is a uh, Catholic church change changed sadly on a part because of the scandals that came out and became public in the in early 2000. Uh, I don't think we could have run that youth house in in today's climate. I don't think we could have run that bilingual mission team with lay people traveling with me as they did as close quarters as we were with traveling all over the country. I looked back at it and I said, there was nothing wrong with what we were doing, but the innuendo of, of traveling with a, a traveling band of missionaries uh, and living with, I mean, young adult, you know, college students. And, and there were two times when that mission team was all women <laughs> and two priests, two priests and all women. 
and traveling all over the country doing that. I mean, most of the time it was half men and half women. Um, one time it was all men, but it was like we had, uh, in a six year period, we had these lay people traveling with us and it was, um, it was a neat, neat experience. Like I said, I don't know if I could do it today in today's church. And, um, but that was something you learned. Now, as later after that, I got in, it was funny, the mission closed and was right about the same exact time that the scandal started breaking and I moved to Kansas and I was with a, four priests in a team there and we spent, I spent six years there. And that was, that engaged me with uh, uh, farm workers in the middle, Midwest part of the country. And I spent that time, we had one priest was a pastor of a parish, one was the director for the diocesan ministry, and I was a missionary in the house going around teaching in all the different parishes around the diocese. Mm -hmm. So that was my job. You've been to so many different places around the U.S. and done this work, so I'm sure it's very difficult to synthesize. But are there, are there challenges facing Spanish-speaking communities in some regions and not others? Yes. What strikes you as... I would say, no, I would say, I wouldn't say that, that there are challenges in every region. The challenges are different from one place to another. Um, there are, when I was in uh, uh, Mississippi, there was much more tension about uh, immigration coming in and raids and, and things like that. There was much more fear uh, among the people of getting out. And I think that was because um, policing would be more aggressive against the immigrant. Um, you didn't have that nearly as strong in other places. Uh, when I was in California and Oregon uh, doing work out there, the rumors of the, of the presence of ICE was always a problem, but it was not so much the, the physical presence of ICE as much. And ICE uh, was much harder and much more um, present in, and I, had a, I worked in a parish in Mississippi where we had 110 families and we had 10 families in process of, of, of deportation at one time. That's a large part of your parish when you figure 10% of your parish is under that immigration process right then. And so I, I got involved a lot with uh, trying to get, referring people to lawyers and getting them done. I, I even took a course to where I could help people with filling out papers and that, but I didn't get to like, be an advocate in court but I took some legal courses on it. And um, immigration uh, has always been, an, it's, 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 it's the elephant in the room in, his, in, in migrant ministry. Uh, when I was in, in liberal Kansas, we had a time when the McCain-Kennedy bill came up before Congress in 2005-06, and it was hope, hopeful time that we could get some immigration reform and it got all messed up by the politicians. But one of the things I had a privilege of doing is I got asked by the American Immigration Lawyers Association to go to Washington and sp speak to Congress about on behalf of U.S. citizen children born of, 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 Im of undocumented immigrants. And, and I took a, I, uh, we, we, we published a, a booklet to give to the, uh, all the congressmen we talked to oh, with pictures of and stories of 40 kids that were U.S. citizens whose parents were could be deported at any time, and it was it was a neat experience to go there. Got to sit in and make our presentation, and and then watch the the, the process get bogged down in the politics. Uh, do any particular moments stick out to you? Any conversations you had on your trip to Washington? Actually, the only the. Um, I said I, we we talked a lot with staff members, and I always felt when I, I I felt that I learned that the staff members are better informed than their than their than their than their congressmen or the senators. It's almost like they have to summarize. And, and the biggest thing was trying to. I found that there were some very good staffs, and I I mean like the staff of 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 uh, McKenna, McLean, I mean McCain and Kennedy, they were terrific. And they did a super job on writing what they did in the study. It, it wasn't perfect, but they did a good job. Um, and then we found some of the some of the staffs were very poorly informed, um, but like I say, some some were very informed. Um, and 
and it surprised me that some of the informed ones were um, were were much on the pro side of getting reform, and some of them were on the negative side, but they were informed. But the but there was also some very largely uninformed, and and I think that the the the, the real guys that got behind negating it, I think they had the, the weaker, they had the weak staff. They didn't have anybody telling them what's the right thing to do. And I think that was, so I look back and, but that was one impression that I had of them. And, but it was, it was, a, it was a neat experience to see the process. And at the time, the U.S. Conference of Bishops created an office called Justice for Immigrants. And I was there when they, they first started. Uh, when was that started? It was 2005. Okay. Um, so, uh, when you were in Washington and, and elsewhere, what were some of the um, maybe ill-informed ideas, not people, but ill-informed ideas that you were running into? Um, I think a lot of folks have a problem, um, think that all the, um, uh, about the undocumented, one of the things that I think is misinformed most undocumented people live with documented people, live with people who are citizens or, or, or permanent residents. A significant part of the population, when you go into a house or a, a home or a, or a field, uh, you can't tell who's documented and who's not by just talking to them, looking to them. Um, I think that the, because of my, my work, I find people more open to me. Um, and I... I think a lot of folks don't know the stories of why people, something I learned recently, I spent the last six months before I came here in Mexico studying the situation on the border today from Matamoros to Tijuana. And we, would, we visited 32 shelters along the border, about eight more in central Mexico. And we always would ask the people, we found out how to ask the right question. Instead of asking por qué or why, we asked, what was your motive for leaving your country? Just softened wording, but it helped. And when we'd ask people, what was your motive for leaving your country? We got a, a much better understanding of the, 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 the problems of living with crime in your community, with uh, a government that's not, um, not providing for health care, education, resources, opportunity, lack of opportunity, but most of all the violence. And I mean, um, with uh, with one one young person I talked to, he said uh, he was 14 years old, trying to come to this country, and he says after they murdered my father and my brother, I knew I had to leave. He was 12 years old when he saw his father murdered right in front of him. He was 14 when his brother was murdered, and he says his his mother and his grandparents said you got to go. And I mean, these are the desperation of people coming to our borders has has grown over the years. When I went to Mexico in 2007, a priest said to me, he says, Father, you need to understand, people don't cross borders to go to another country because of poverty. They go because of desperation. And that desperation can be different from one person to another. For one person, it's opportunity. It's an education, ch chance for education where they didn't have it in their own country. But many times it's for violence and getting away from violence, or oppression, abuse. and it's desperation that brings people here, and I wish that more people would understand we're looking at desperate people who many times may be facing their own, their own vulnerability, and I wish that that would be more present. Um, you had mentioned um, working with people as they were uh, confronted with ICE. Mm -hmm. What was your role beyond the legal piece of it? Um, in the lives of these families that you're talking about? Well, I think we're, a ref we're a referral, to refer people to um, resources for help, such as in uh, education, housing, health care, legal services, social services. Mm -hmm. that's, one of the, um, that's one of the things I think that our Catholic Charities offices do well. Not that there were, we got a long ways to go. It's like, I always like to say, we've come so far, we've got so far to go. But the reality is that uh, we do a pretty good job of giving people the, some help and support. And we also do that with other combination with other churches. That's where we have good ecumenical work and relationship. What we struggle with 
is uh, um, touching people's lives in the area of uh, um, mental health, well-being, and spiritual health. Uh, Pope Francis wrote, and he says, the greatest scandal or its greatest challenge to our ministry with the poor is our lack of spiritual care. He says, we're, we're better at doing the social stuff than we are the spiritual care. And that's, and I think that's part of why I got, got asked by the bishops to be part of this group that I'm in, because of uh, uh, I've, I've focused most of my attention towards how do we get beyond the, the social care to move towards the spiritual care. Um, but I, but I also have the knowledge of being working, having worked in the social field a lot. I mean, I've argued, I've been in court about ten or twelve times for immigration court. I've been in civil court for uh, for other things to testify, witness to people's good character or things like that. About ten times. Um, I actually coordinated a case where we won. Uh, uh, suspension of deportation way back in 1993. Can you talk more about that? Briefly. Uh, what happened was the, the couple was, um, a raid was done on their apartment building and the police, FBI, and INS was there. This was INS days before ICE. And the police right away saw this is not a drug house. This is not, and they, they were doing for drugs and, and drug dealers that are what, what looking for. So if FBI and the police were left, and the INS guy goes and he says, uh, are you guys legal? And the woman says, no. <laughs> she told him that up front. And he says, where's your husband? At work. And he said, well, can you come and see me in my office tomorrow? So they decided, Father, could you go with us? So I went to the office with him the next morning. And the agent wouldn't, I mean, I couldn't sit with them when he was talking to them. But he comes out afterwards and he says, Father, this couple qualifies for a petition for a hearing on hardship that they could be uh, suspended deport suspend the deportation order, and he said, uh, "Get him a lawyer." So I I went work looking for lawyers, and everybody says, "Yeah, they have a right to it, but they'll never win because they couldn't prove that they had been here seven years. They had at that time it had to be seven years. They'd only been here seven years and two weeks." So we go and I finally find it, found a dumb lawyer who wouldn't uh, who who didn't know better, and he said, "I'll help you." And he was not Catholic, didn't speak Spanish, and never did an immigration case. Looking for a lawyer to help him, so I go back to Spence, the INS guy, and I I said, "What's your what, what, how, how can I get help for them to understand?" He said, "Well, talk to my boss." So I talked to the director for immigration at that time, and he and I talked, and. I went into his office and he said, uh, where'd you go to school, Father? We talked for half an hour about life in New York and going to school in New York. He and I both went to school there. And he says, now how can I help you? I told him what I needed and he said, well, I'll get you a lawyer to help you with that. And we went in our preparation. We knew that we, did, we couldn't prove that they'd been here that long because they worked hand, you know, cash under the table at first, lived with his cousin, and then ends up... Uh, Thanksgiving dinner, I'm having dinner with the family, and I said, tell me one more time your story. I said, why did you come to America when you did? To be, to be godparents at a baptism. And I said, what day? And we got, it was two days before, it, it qualified for seven years and two days. And so we had the baptismal certificate, not knowing if the court would, would accept that as the proof, but we took that in and we presented that as our proof that they'd been here seven years and the judge asked the lawyer, well, are you going to contest this? And he said, no. And it was like, then we had, we had to prove the other parts, and we, good character was the easy part. Hardship was difficult to get, explain it, but we won. And I went to thank the INS director afterwards for helping us, and he said, now you can help me. I need some help with the uh, amnesty crowd is now starting to qualify for citizenship, and we want the government wants to prepare people for citizenship classes. We thought if we could do it in a church, could you get us eight churches around the state of Colorado to host INS people to teach people how to get ready for citizenship? And so he and I became good friends. When I, when I left Mississippi, I went to his house to go take a vacation and went fishing with him for a few days. And people think, you and a head honcho in ice? 
for vacation? I said, yep. <laughs> well, how have you seen the legal system, your role in the legal system, change from INS to ICE? That is, I think, one of the one of the the worst parts, in my opinion, of the P Patriot Act was the not understanding the is the importance for the people who work for INS and ICE to be able to know both sides of the immigration issue, citizenship and border patrol or c control of our borders. It should, if, if because it was separated, the people who worked in ICE didn't know, they don't know the, the good people who are coming in. They begin to see, all they see is the criminal element that is actually not the ones coming in, but the ones who are guiding them in. And the, uh, they lose sight of the humanity of the people they're serving. And to me, that was one of the greatest challenges that they did. Um, I look back to my time in Denver. Uh, we had a program called um, Weed and Seed for the police officers. It was a community policing project to get the police out of their cars and into seeing the neighborhoods they were in. One of the police officers, I was a chaplain to him, to them, and the police officer said to me, he says, you know, after walking the beat for three hours a day, twice a week, he says, now I know who I'm here to serve and protect. All I also saw before that was criminals and people who haven't been caught yet. <laughs> and Tony learned that. And I, I, think the, I think a lot of our ICE agents and our Border Patrol people, they don't know the humanity of the people they're I mean, some of them are, I mean, a lot of them are good, but it, there's too many who, who, um, who don't know and don't know, know the people that are, if they would understand a little better, they might know the difference between a criminal and uh, a, a person who's desperate trying to get away from violence or that. And how has that affected your role? Um, pre and current situation. It's actually, well, I would say one thing it's probably done, maybe I don't know if it's good, is uh, I've had to find, I have had to personally have to separate myself from the legal issue process. Really? I've had to find myself uh, um, be uh, a referral person to people trying to get help with it rather than being actively engaged in it. I did for a time, you know, work with, directly with people preparing them for cases and stuff like that. And, um, I was getting too angry with that. It was it was it was not healthy for me, and I don't think I was really. Um, it wasn't healthy for the. I needed somebody with a little more perspective, and I had to get perspective in my life. So it it definitely changed in the last uh, five years. From my advocacy role has become more referral than directly direct advocacy. Mm -hmm. Well, I was going to save that question for the end, but one of my questions was, how do you manage? How do I what? Manage. Um, my management, have, my, my best part of, for me has been the fact that I've, uh, I've been allowed by my superiors to, to, to move around the country in so many ways. Um, I, I, I wrote, when, when COVID hit, I, needed to find how to get my Facebook page to be more understanding of who I was. I had just a, I, all, all I used Facebook for was family pictures and that type of stuff. But when we had to start putting online uh, masses and I information and things like that, Father Mike is the one who helped me. He says, you need a different name for your Facebook page or another Facebook page. I said, well, you, what do you mean, like Father Mike McAndrew, Redemptorist Missionary? And it's, no, no, no. Something that identifies you with your work. So my Facebook page is Padre Migrante. And then I got the web, I got the email site, Padre Migrante at Gmail. And then I got a website, uh, PadreMigrante.org. And so I got, I got a lock on that name. And I realized that in my own work, I, I have moved around like a lot of migrants. I mean, I'm an unusual member of my community. I've, I have lived in 17 different places since I took my vows as a redemptorist 55 years ago. I mean, to live in 17 different homes in that time is a little, I mean, in 17 homes in 11 states. Oh. Uh, you had also mentioned uh, amnesty cases. Are those different from the other kinds of 
Is, Am is your role ca different? Well, the amnesty was done in the 1980s, late, late 80s. Oh, okay. And those were the folks that got uh, legal residence here in this country, and they got permanent residency. Um, after five years of uh, permanent residency, they qualified for application for citizenship. And, um, and I was very much encouraged by the, both the INS approach to it and, and our, our, you know, I, I think that some of the people who come to this country, they're never going to become American citizens. That's not their dream or hope. But I kept telling people, if you're going to stay here, become part of the community. Become part of uh, school boards. Uh, go, to, go to your PTA meetings. Do that. Be become an engaged citizen of where you're living. And I, I wanted people to, um, I don't want them to always feel like, hey, I'm, I'm on the outside. And I thought that was a, a good, I, I think that is a good thing. For an Im if an immigrant decides they're going to live here for the rest of their lives, dual citizenship, most, many of the countries, uh, I mean, they, there's some question whether they renounce their citizenship from another place or not. It doesn't really matter because a lot of countries don't recognize that. I mean, like, I mean, even I, two generations removed from my dad, my dad was born here, my grandparents came from Ireland. I have a right to get an Irish, citizen, Irish passport, Irish citizenship, and I can be a dual citizen. Um, there's, I, I know that Italy and Ireland and a couple other places in Europe, they, they will take Americans who, who are second generation and make them citizens. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why some of those places have good hockey teams. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you uh, uh, were involved in Justice for Immigrants, um, and then what happens after that? Well, I just, I mean, Justice for Immigrants, I've, never, I've not been really part of it. I've been, okay. um, uh, I mean, I've been involved with immigration and uh, the, the leadership of Justice for Immigrants knows me and has known me for a long time. But uh, I, I, I've, this is my first time to actually be engaged in a church-related uh, uh, national level uh, head office where I just, and I've been on it a week. The Catholic Migrant Farmworker Network. I was the diocesan director for Farmworker Ministry for Fresno for for four years. Actually, five years I worked there. The bishop asked me to, before I took the job, he said, I want you to spend a year doing preaching missions in my diocese so you get to know my people. And then after I finished that and gave a report of what I saw, he said, now would you be my director? <laughs> so that's how I became the director there. So uh, tell me a little bit more about your time in Fresno. What were you learning? What were you seeing? What I saw was uh, um, a diocese that is, uh, um, it has, has some of the most intense agricultural production in America, the most labor-intense agricultural production in America, fruit, vegetables, nuts. Um, the, the amount of labor intensity, I mean, like, lived, I come from Nebraska, where people, you know, they, they plant and harvest their wheat and the corn and things like that in Kansas, where I was at, meatpacking. But uh, the reality was that uh, uh, farms, big farms have, you know, several workers running their tractors and plows and that stuff, but they don't have the, in, the labor intensity of uh, fruit and vegetables. Any veg, any, anything that needs hand labor harvesting. So when I got there, the estimate was made there were 200,000 farm workers in the in the Fresno diocese, 650,000 in the state of California. So when you look at that those numbers, that you had that many uh, laborers in, and we were the di we were the largest um, diocese for farm workers, but the, you you realize that's a different type of agriculture than. And and then you come out come out here, and I realized that where you find fruit and vegetables and and um, slaughterhouses, uh, dairies, you'll have a lot of workers and 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 intensity for labor. But when you're out in the where there's fields everywhere, and it's just out out in open fields like Mississippi and Mississippi was very scattered. It was very hard to find labor communities. Uh, that was a real different. I mean, I spent five years there, but it was tough to even 
to cluster people for any kind of ministry. Where in California, with that many workers, there were trailer parks that was purely workers from the field, or even cities that have neighborhoods that were. I mean, like you could go into downtown Denver. I mean, downtown Fresno area, and you could have a, a, a neighborhood that was all farm workers, and they. At, you know, at daytime they're all, they're driving 40, 50 miles away for work, but they come home every night. So it was a different, you know, ex, each place has its different realities. Even like the state of Virginia, for example, if you go from the Eastern Shore to Tennessee, this is a, this is a long, lengthy diocese with many many different agricultural interests, and so some of those agricultural interests are are more intensely uh, labor intense than others. Uh, the Eastern Shore has a pretty significant labor intensity of the workers here with the, the vegetables and that they, they produce and with the uh, poultry plants and packing houses. Even here, the people here are telling me that it's a lot different than past, that there probably is less labor intensity in the fields than there was before, but there's more plants. so. The processing is the industry here. And one of the things about agricultural work, and this this has to do both locally here in Virginia, but nationally. Um, our CMFN did a study in 2007 of uh, the percentage of workers in rural, of, of immigrant laborers who live in rural communities. And in the 1960s, it was like 65% of immigrant labor in uh, in a rural community was in agriculture. Now it's only 35%. And they're now working in gardening, roofing, construction, bridge building, road construction, uh, nursing homes and maintenance, restaurants, tourism. So that when you look at the, uh, the, the, the immigrant population, I mean, and the, I mean, there are some states where some regions where the the health care is is sixty and seventy percent immigrant working in the in the healthcare industry. Doctors, nurses, th physicians, uh, th physical therapists, cooks, and maintenance of the places. It's, I mean, in the state of Kansas, if, in many of these the, the, the counties in Kansas. Healthcare is, it's an immigrant based healthcare system. And we don't, we don't think of that. Usually that's, that's oftentimes Asian. Hmm. Okay. How does that uh, shift affect your work? How you organize? I'm thinking especially of the scale that you saw in Fresno. Well, for me, it's, I, I, it's changed over time because when I first started working, it, I was the on hands going out to the field, which I love doing. I mean, to go out and say a mass in a migrant camp is great. But what's happening now is I'm I'm in a position for the first time I think that I can tell my stories and tell and hopefully impact uh, uh, regional and church leaders about how to be more aware of the the presence of the Hispanic community in their midst and their cultural needs. Um, I mean, when in the past I might have been uh, organizing and coordinating fe celebrations of, of liturgical and, re and cultural feasts like Guadalupe and Mexican Independence Day or things like that, or, or other countries' Independence Days, um, instead of being out there working with the people getting ready for those feasts, I'm talking to priests and religious leaders about making that a part of your ministry. And how, do you, how do you see that? So it's it's a little my my ministry has changed a little from from being the on hands out in the field worker to to being a trainer of uh, of hopefully openness to more more leaders. Before we leave, then the the on the ground um, piece of your work, um, you mentioned spiritual care and developing. Uh, mm -hmm. A greater focus on that across the church and in your own work. Mm -hmm. How has your thinking about the spiritual care part of mission work changed over time? Um, I believe that people need us to walk with them more than. I think we need to 
first be able to walk with the people and develop relationship. Our ministry is building relationships of, our, of Christ to the people, us, the church to the people. And, and, then, and then once the a relationship is being built, then you start to talk about the doctrine, the, the, the catechism, the theology. And you can give them the reasons to explain, why do you believe what you believe? And the other day I had somebody ask me, I, I told them, you know, they were saying they had doubts about their faith. And I said, well, that's good. It's okay to doubt your faith. I said, everybody doubts it. Mary doubted the angel when the angel Gabriel said you were to conceive the child Jesus. She doubted it. And uh, she said, how can this be? And in the end, the angel explained it to her, the Spirit of God can come upon you. The Spirit of God will overcover, cover you. And she says, okay, I'm the handmaid of the Lord. You know, she didn't have a theological presentation. She just said, if God's going to be with me, I'm going to be okay. And um, doubts are a part of any faith journey. And I would love to say to people, uh, um, it's okay to doubt. It's okay to question. And if you don't have times of doubt, I mean, we're not identifying with the scriptural presentation of people who followed. I mean, Job had his doubts. Mary had her doubts. Jesus on the cross said, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? How can we go and not and be, expect somehow we're not going to have doubts? But in the end, it's not about about theology or doubts. It's about, I choose to believe. I choose to believe that this is a better way of life, and I will be a better person and live better if I follow the, the teachings of Jesus and the teachings of my, my church. On the organizing side of things, keeping okay. that in mind, um, you mentioned that the, the church structures, particularly around Catholic charities, has changed over time. Mm -hmm. How have you seen that affect your work? Well, I, I think what what's changed is I think that uh, um, in in my understanding of the I mean I I think Catholic Churches does the, a great job of the social issues. I think that where where our church is dropping is not 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 as failing to uh, follow through with uh, spiritual care. I th that's I don't, I'm not sure if that helps you understand that or not. A little bit. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, yeah. And then you said that there's also inner church organizing that's yeah. occurring. Uh, some of the best work you can do is when you work where you respect each other. And I, my feeling is uh, that uh, the challenge to all of us ministers, I don't care what religion we are, is we need to be the leaders showing our people it's okay to, to meet and greet and welcome and and converse with the, uh, people of other faiths. I had a privilege one time going down to a Baptist church in South Florida. My cousin's husband is a Baptist minister, so it's part of the family. And he asked me to preach in his church. And I said, what do you want me to talk about? And he says, talk about the scandal of divisions between churches. And I said, I'm not doing that alone. You and I are doing that together. And so he and I gave this talk about you know, respecting each other. And people came up to the afterwards and they said, it was so nice to hear a Catholic priest and a Baptist minister sharing the pulpit together. They said, we don't see that very often. And however often we, we see it, it's not enough. And it was, uh, and of course, we, you know, Don and I just said, well, you know, we, we have to get together because we're family. <laughs> you know, it was, it was, it was, I just think that ecumenical work is, is something that we all need to be doing better work. When I was doing prison ministry in, in Mississippi, we had to have a, by requirements of the prison, we had to have a training every year. It was boring as could be. But I began to realize that the head chaplain, he looked at us with, because we came, you know, three, four years in a row to the training. He says, you guys are my helpers in it. You know, you're helping. And one of the things that was very emphasized always by the prison system was you cannot proselytize in prison. You have to respect all religions and faiths. And that was easy for us. But there are some churches, I mean, like Jehovah Witnesses and some that are, are very pushy about their faith. And they found that hard. And I, and, but they had to have us, the chaplain says, we need you to you know, explain to them why it's, why it's important. And you know, it, was, it was an interesting 
uh, five years that I was in Mississippi doing mass at that prison. I mean, all, we we took turns, but we always had we had to take two of us up there to do the prison mass because they had two they had two separate chapels and they wouldn't put them back to back, so we had to same hour for both chapels. And we do we so we did have two priests there, but it was an interesting experience. Um. I think we left you in 2005, 2006 mm -hmm. was the last kind of a big life event. What happens after that in your work? Well, that was when I went, when uh, immigration did a raid. I was, in, I was living in Kansas at the time, and I was working at a parish, and immigration did a terrible raid of six meatpacking plants in six different states on December 12th, 2006. That's the most important feast day of Mexican people. It's the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe. It's the day that we celebrate. And I was saying mass that day, and and all of a sudden I could just recognize people were getting phone calls, messages from people around, from their their family members who are in other other in other other communities of meatpacking plants. So some of the folks in our our meatpacking plant, liberal, had family members in Greeley, Colorado, and in Dumas, uh, um, uh, Texas. And so here they were um, getting the calls that their family members had been picked up for immigration. They, the raid picked up 15, 1,500 people and um, two to 300 children in each, each community had lost contact with their parents. And, many, and the good thing was the churches did a job of, in all those places, of responding to with schools and the churches did phenomenal jobs in every one of those towns, including some of the local police departments who refused to participate in the raid, uh, like Grand Island, Nebraska. But the the Dumas was about thirty, about four, fifty miles from us, and so two days after the raid, I went down there to take food and, sh and blankets and things like that to help the pastor out with caring for some of the kids. You know, they got some of the kids into homes. So they had 80 kids in the school living in the school gym, boarded up there. So I, we took food and stuff down there, and I, I got to hold a child. The, the husband had been in the plant, called his wife, told, him, told her that, go to my sister's house. Uh, I, the, ICE is here. I don't know what they're going to do with me. He says, if I get taken into custody, you know, know that I love you. And that's what he said. Well, she was pregnant, almost nine months pregnant. In running out of the house to her sister's house, she fell, went into, went into labor, gave birth to the child, and in the process, she went into a coma in the hospital. The, the sister was there present with this little baby, had gotten the baby, and gave me the baby in my hands. And I'm holding a little infant, two days old, and, you know, her father has... Act, they, they did. They did. Um, they deported some of those people right away. Her father was deported to uh, Guatemala. The mother's in a coma, and she's from Mexico, and she's in the hospital. What's going to happen to this little baby? I told that to our 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 parish the following Sunday, and I was crying on the altar. I had eight people write notes. Four, when we, four were sort of like in sympathy, and four were saying, all you care about is those illegals. You don't belong here. And after a couple of months, uh, it was determined from my superiors, maybe you ought to go take a sabbatical. And that's when I took my sabbatical down to Mexico. I went six weeks traveling Mexico and three months picking cherries in California and Oregon and ended up getting to walk that way with the people. So that's when I really got intensely involved with the farm workers because I got to know them there. But, I mean, I picked cherries for that summer and they, it was amazing. I mean, I'll never forget the first day. I'm out in the field, coming back after we're all finished, two guys are in a pickup truck drinking a beer. They took their beer and hid it behind them and they said, see you tomorrow, Padre. At the next day, I come by the same two guys. Padre, you want a beer? I knew I was in, and I did that for three months, and that really got me to where. From then on, I, I was intensely involved with the 
uh, getting to know more about the farm. farm I, for me, working out in the field with workers was, was a part-time summer, summer project uh, before that, but it became my full-time ministry at that point. And I had, and I said, so like I said, I had five years in, in, uh, in Fresno, five years in uh, Mississippi. I had three and a half years of going out and helping priests like Father Mike go away to study. I'd take their place for three months while they went away. And I did that for priests in, uh, here in Virginia, Oklahoma, and Texas over that period of time. And a, a short three month period in uh, Jefferson City Diocese of Missouri to help the bishop analyze his Hispanic outreach to the farmers, farm workers. And then I went to Mexico for six months to study the border. Now I'm on this new job. So. And what do you hope for the future? I hope to be able to to make a, an inroad in our our understanding of clergy, of what what's needed for the farm workers. I, I would hope to see um, diocesan have the opportunity to speak to diocesan convocations of priests to be better appreciative and understanding because we need more consistency in how we reach out to the farm worker community. Uh, some of the guys do good, really great stuff and they need to be patted on the back and say, you know, here's what you're doing well and do it and, and here's what might do better. There's just a lot of areas where we're, we, we, we have expectations that the ordinary ministry of the church does enough and I just don't, I see it as extraordinary ministry that needs to be done out of the ordinary. I don't mean extraordinary in hard, how hard it is. I mean, in, it has to be, the, the ordinary ministry is not reaching enough people. And we got too many people that are, are sort of on the fringe. Mm -hmm. or leaving them out. I would hope to teach. What are the good models that you're seeing out there in your world? I'm going to tell you, this one here is, they're doing a good job. This Eastern Shore part of their, their ministry here is doing a good job. Um, there are three communities in the Catholic Church that I think have been really Im important in it. One is called CEPI, and it's the Southeastern Pastoral Institute, which is more of an academic institute that teaches and trains people with, pro with getting uh, masters in, in Hispanic ministry. So they really are masters in, in, in yeah, Hispanic ministry. CEPI was formed 35 years ago, same time about as CM, CMFN was formed. MAC is the Mexican American Cultural Center in San Antonio, great resource. And, uh, and I think that we're the, the one more with the farm worker in, in influence. The other thing that I look to is some of the Catholic universities that have created master's programs in Hispanic studies. Um, and I mean, theology programs that would have Hispanic uh, part of it. Uh, Boston College, Notre Dame, Berry College, Loyola Marymount in L.A., Mexican American Cultural College, um, Creighton University are, are among the ones that I'm familiar with, but I'm sure there's more. And there's another group that I need to get to know that I haven't even, I've just found out about is the, um, it's an, it's a uh, ecumenical group and it's, we're called CMFN and they're like national um, national farm worker ministry so in uh, national migrant farm worker ministry and that's a it's a it's a ecumenical group um, and so we need to be, we need to get together <laughs> uh, and I know that our leadership in theirs has, has been already I'm 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 just finding out about them through my our program but the uh, the N, uh, I think it's N, N National Catholic, and not, not National Farm Worker Ministries, uh, we need to get together with them. Mm -hmm. What does a good future look like where you work yourself out of a job? Well, that'd always be great, especially as, at my age, I need to do that. I need to find, it'd be nice to be able to find people who will follow in the footsteps of uh, um, doing ministry. So I look at Father Mike, Imperial here, and I'm 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 thrilled that he's he's taken such a an active role of wanting to do this ministry. 
one of the things that I, um, I mean, I hope my own community is a redemptress that I can get more people to do follow this this type of ministry too. Um, but my hope is that our seminar. I would love to see seminaries invite invite myself or Tom, the the other the other person with our office, to come and speak to their seminarians while they're in formation, so that they get at least an understanding that um, that all of our ordinary ministry has to take a, an interest in the the people who are missing. Oh. When I when we've got some great writings in the past in the in our church, we we I mean, one of the things I worked with the bishop uh, John Steinbach from Fresno when he was there, and he in 2010 he gave a great talk to us about uh, worrying about the people who live under live under under pit bridges and in cars and in prisons and. He was talking about how we as a church need, and he's talking about not, it's not, he wasn't talking about Hispanic ministry, he was talking about all ministry. We're missing the people that uh, do not feel comfortable in our midst. Um, people who've experienced mental health issues, people who've experienced uh, suicide in their family, people who've experienced uh, um, challenges because of sexual identity. How are we reaching them? They're part of our constituents too. and. And then two weeks later, he announced that he, was, he had cancer and he was dying of cancer. It was his last, it was, I call it his last talk, it was his last talk to us as priests of that diocese. And that was, um, that was in 2010. So we follow, we need to, I hope that we can, I can give to people, somebody follows it and says, oh, are my, my eyes are on the people we're missing, we abandoned. So, is, is there anything you'd like to add? Uh, about your visit here, since you're here in, in Virginia, this is one of the more complex dioceses I've ever seen for its outreach to across various cultures and and dynamics. The the reality that you have um, so many different types of farm labor in this this community, it's going to challenge all the church leaders to be creative in how they're working on this. Um, you know, and like I say, they've they've got something good going here, um, but uh, um, a real challenge to the bishop here is going to be, you know, coordinating from one side because it it could be things that work here may not work in another place, and things that work there may not work here. Uh, I think some parts of the diocese here will have a lot better work with the farmers, I mean growers, and and I always. I always found that the growers were very helpful to me in reaching out to their people. Most growers that I find are appreciative of their workers, and they want help for their workers. Um, one thing that I found, in at least in California and Oregon, was most of the growers were very supportive of wanting a legalization process for our workers, because they, they want a legal workforce. They want the people who, can, who they can trust. Um, but the the politicians need to listen to the people on the ground. You know, mm -hmm. funny story about that. Fresno, one of the congressmen came to visit us, and he 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 wanted he wanted to talk to people in in Fresno about immigration issues and what we felt about it. And we gathered the uh, head of the Hispanic Studies Department for Fresno State University. We had uh, people from. Uh, uh, various churches. We had the UFW president. We had the uh, Nisei Farmers League Growers Association president. We had people from the police departments. We had people from all these groups that we had the Dreamers were there and all this. And the guy comes in and it's supposed to be a listening session is what he's typed tabbed as. For 20 minutes he wouldn't shut up. He just talked and talked and talked and then he reached for a bottle of water and I stopped him. I says, Sir, now that you've you, you've stopped for a moment, could you please stop and listen to these people? You've gathered the best people I know in Fresno who are knowledgeable about the immigration situation here. Could you just listen to them? Well, and all of a sudden it was like, you know, he said, okay, Father, I got it. I understand. And he, he shut up. So for 40 minutes, we got a chance to talk to him. And it was, but that was a funny, I had to stop him. <laughs> And I had people afterwards say, 
you know, he's one of our friends. He's one of the politicians that we can count on. And I said, you, you insulted him. I said, no, I just got him. To, I said, I want him to listen to you guys. <laughs> and, and a lot of the folks, were, the dreamers came up and said, thank you, thank you. Um, okay, anything thank I'm you. missing? You, you probably have more, more work to do, so no, I can it's let okay. you know. I, uh, yeah, I can start.